All right, so welcome to uh, Don Bluth, Unsung Hero of Animation. And um, again, as you can see, we are at home. Uh, I just came back from, we just got back from vacation and we're not really keen to, I was not keen to go into work. Um, but uh, this show must go on and I'm a huge Don Bluth fan. So I wanted to make sure this program happened. There we are. So I had, I'm so used to doing this on the library computers. I'm like, oh no, I'm back on my regular, my, uh, my home computer. I need to do keynotes. So uh, this is Don Bluth, the hero of American animation. Um, if you don't know the name, you likely know some of his work, uh, Land Before Time, An American Tale, Secret of Nim, Anastasia, um, although I will say proper pronunciation of that name is Anastasia. Uh, we'll, we'll get, we'll get to that. Titan AE and uh, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Um, He's someone who, when Disney was kind of floundering, and this is something we can't imagine now with Disney being just the entertainment juggernaut that it is, Don Bluth decided to step out on his own, step away from Disney, and create his own animation, which at that point, there had been, there was other animation besides Disney, but there was no one that had directly challenged Disney. Um, and he is someone who, there is a case to be made that if not for him the landscape of cinema would look a lot different so before we go any further i'm going to play an audio clip from one of my favorite podcasts um 80s all over which unfortunately is no longer an active podcast but i would really recommend go back and listening to the episodes um b2 hosts they go back to the 80s they try to look at these movies in context they try to look at it in um you know, look at the trends. And one of the things I learned about that movie was how different the 80s looked. But one of the ongoing things they discussed was where Disney was in the early 80s, which was, um, again, kind of circling the drain and not really knowing where to go. I can make a case for this being the single most important animated film since Snow White. At this point, we've talked repeatedly now on this podcast about how Disney had hit a wall, not even a speed bump. They'd hit a wall, and they basically weren't functional as a company anymore. Their live action division was floundering. Their animation division was in shambles. Uh, there was an entire generation of young animators that had come up kind of watching the Disney movies who wanted to be those guys, guys like Don Bluth and Tim Burton. And, you know, some of the old men were still there, and there was a, a sort of a generational torch being passed. Don Bluth was one of the guys who led this charge where they realized Walt Disney's not going to let us make movies. They're not going to let us make our movies. They're not going to let us be in charge. We're going to be apprentices for the next 25 years and we'll never really have a creative voice here. He led a revolution where he walked out of the studio with a ton of animators and they said, we're going to go make our own movies. Now, at the time, there was no competition for Disney in the animation realm at all. There just wasn't. Nobody did it on the feature level except them. When Don Bluth raised the money to independently make this movie, what he did was establish, A, he could do a Disney movie his own way. And it's really not a Disney movie. It's stranger. It's weirder. It's got way more atmosphere. He learned his lessons from Disney, clearly. But he made an independent animated film at a time where no one did, released it. He had a monster hit. He finally broke through and he proved you can do it. Don Bluth was the first guy who genuinely challenged them and beat them at their own game. And if he had not, if that had not happened, I think not only would Disney have gone out of business, but I don't think there would be a family animation market today. All right. So that was Drew McQueenie the host of 80s all over. Um, I don't know if I'd agree with him that Disney would have gone out of business completely. I just, um, but I do think the landscape of animation would look a lot different had Don Bluth not struck out on his own. And ultimately there is no way to know what would have happened. Um, there were other animators who were at Disney like uh, John Lasseter, Tim Burton was there and they were also getting dissatisfied. So you could also make a case that someone would have done it eventually, but if we are looking at just history as it happened, Don Bluth striking out 
showed it showed studios that there was still a market for animation for children and not just you know anything but good animation for children and good storytelling um and it showed that like you know animation is not a dead market there are still people who want it because it's also worth remembering in the 80s the market for children's films was very different um it was still something seen as like, oh, kids don't really go to movies. Movies are mostly, we're trying to get the older crowd in. So it really was one where it was a game changer. So, I mean, regardless, I mean, we can talk about an alternate history of this, but Don Bluth did change the game. But let's talk about the man himself. Um, so Don Bluth, it, I had no idea he was this old. I always pictured him being a lot younger. Um, he was born in 1937 in El Paso, Texas. His mom was a homemaker. His father was a sheriff. And he notes in his book, which is called Somewhere Out There, My Animated Life. Uh, it's actually a really good read if you'd like to pick it up. And it's got a lot of good behind the scenes stories. He notes that he was born 99 days before Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs premiered. And that is, uh, we'll discuss a little later, a formative film for him. So his family moves to Utah when he was six. He moves around quite a bit. School is not quite his favorite thing. In fact, he grows up not really liking reading, not really liking English and not gelling with it. Uh, but he does grow up loving animals. He grows up liking to play and use his imagination. Um, and he likes to draw. He learns that that is something he likes to do. He's not entirely supported by his family. I mean, his father's a sheriff, definitely kind of the more manly man type. And Don did kind of wonder like, am I ever gonna be a man like my dad? And kind of wondering, is this sort of a sissy profession for him when he was younger? Uh, but he did have encouragement from people, especially his mom, from teachers to develop that skill. He also credits there was this radio show called Let's Pretend. And he said, he's like, along with Walt Disney, I would have loved to have met the host of this to just thank her for helping me develop my skill and sort of pursue, uh, you know, give him the courage to pursue his dream. So starts out in Texas, moves to Utah. Eventually um, the farm doesn't do that well. So they decide to sell it. And when he's a teenager, his family moves to California. And he then comes very close to a certain animation studio. So this is a turning point in Don Bluth's life. He talks about it in his book. Um, he sees Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Um, he was, I believe, he says he was around four years old and he watched it with his mother. And he remembered being enthralled, being terrified, being thrilled, just uh, sort of similar to if you, see, you know, anyone who sees Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, I actually remember it when I was young being fairly terrifying, especially the witch, at, the confrontation with the witch at the end. Um, people like to think Disney was always this just bright and bubbly brand. I'm like, no, if you look at the earliest films, that darkness, which we see in Don's films as well, was always a little bit of a part of Disney. Walt Disney himself was not afraid to get scary and to get a little menacing. So this is quote is from his book. I came away from Snow White bowled over by the colors, the story and the emotion. I didn't know what I, I didn't know that what I had just, I had seen was called animation. I just liked what I saw and one taste of it was not enough. I wanted more, but of all the questions I had coming out of the theater that day, the biggest one was who is Walt Disney? That was the day Santa Claus dropped to hero number two. So this is really, as he puts it, the ground zero for him wanting to be an animator. He, this is what got him like, I love drawing. He wanted to work for Walt Disney. It was a lifelong dream for him. He saw it in, you know, some people go their entire lives not quite knowing what they want to do. He is someone who decided young age, like, this is it. This is my goal. This is my path. I'm going to find a way to get there. And credit to Don Bluth, he did. I mean, clearly like we're here talking about him right now. So, I mean, obviously his parents weren't going to just let a 16 year old kid go to Disney. Uh, they were fo focused on like, you've got to graduate high school. You do have to go to college and get an education. I think as most reasonable parents would be. But Don wasn't quite happy at college. He wasn't quite 
gelling with everything. Um, he did manage to meet when he was at college. He met um, someone who had a connection to Disney. So it's like, oh, well, there's it, who encouraged him. Like, you should look into this. If this is what you want to do, go do it. So he uh, proposes a deal to his parents. So first year, uh, Brigham Young Year University, if he can get straight A's, he could leave and then apply to Disney. And as he puts it like, oh, Saints Prairie is my parents bought it. <laughs> and he did, he worked hard, um, even though there were some subjects he had like English, he worked as hard as he could because he's like, I want to animate. So calls up Disney. And when I tell you he pleads his way into an interview, that's pretty much what it was. And he, he says so much himself, but he brings his portfolio in and they're like, all right, you know what? You do clearly have talent. You've got skill and you clearly want to be here. So they hire him and he starts working in the bullpen, which is, you know, you don't go straight to head animator. Bullpen is where you are doing background characters, background artwork. You're doing some of the in-between stuff. Um, and again, this is not the way animation quite works now, but back in the old days of 2D hand-drawn animation, there would be just like, in some cases, hundreds of people just working on background stuff in this bullpen drawing. Um, and he started working on one of, I would say Disney, uh, Disney's best Walt films, Sleeping Beauty. Um, I love that movie. It just has such a really cool like look in a point of view. Um, and he did end up meeting Walt Disney. So that was another one of his dreams. So he's at a volleyball game. They, um, you know, Disney, the animation studio is a, you can imagine a huge complex. There's a ton of people there. They have, it's, um, kind of like what you would imagine working at something like Google where they have recreation areas and whatnot. So there was a work volleyball game. He's playing with people and he goes over to get the ball and bumps into somebody. And is the way he describes it, he's just dumbstruck and is like, oh, I'm sorry. And of course, after his people are like, do you know who that was? He goes, of course I know who that was. So fulfills his dream of meeting Walt Disney. And you know, Walt was fine. He was just like, oh, carry on. But you know, probably not the way he wanted to meet him. So you notice the slide says Disney round one. Um, when I had initially, you know, heard about Don Bluth, I had thought, oh, he joined up Disney, worked there for a long time, and then left. Turns out that was not the case. So one year after joining Disney, uh, Don Bluth leaves it. Um, this was something I did not know. Don Bluth was a Mormon, and his faith is something that's very personal to him. And if you, um, one of the things that you're supposed to do if you're in the Mormon church is do a mission trip. It's I, He said you either get married right away or you do a mission trip. And he had been asked, like, are you going to do this? And he didn't know. He's like, I just started at Disney and this is a great opportunity for me. But he asked himself, like, do you love, which do you love more? Do you love God or do you love animation? And for him, he made his decision and he's just said, is like, this is something I feel like I have to do. So he leaves and he is assigned to Argentina for 2.5 years. Um, and he talks about that trip in his book and um, oof, it does not sound fun. He ends up getting multiple infections. He gets some skin problems, which I'm someone who breaks out into hives when I like, when the weather is 83 degrees, so I can feel him. I don't know how I would do in South America, probably not well. Um, and, but he still is able to utilize drawing and artwork in some way. So he goes to Argentina, he doesn't know Spanish. So he has to kind of learn by doing, but one of the ways he starts to communicate with the people who live there is via artwork. So he still utilizes that skill. And he comes back, um, you know, definitely gets sick, but he, you know, he has some time. He has to like reintegrate into the world. And he said, that's actually a common thing with the missionaries is once they get back and reintegrate, it is a, a long process because it's such a, you have the culture shock going there and then you have the culture shock going back because you've been so used to being in one place. But overall, he said the one thing that experience truly taught him was it was humbling. 
And it was how to be humble because when he talks about his first time at Disney, he went in thinking he was kind of a hot shot and trying to step over people and get ahead. Whereas the mission trip taught him, you're not quite a hot shot. You have a long way to go. So when he comes back, he decides to go back to Brigham Young University and get his college degree. And ironically, majors in English, which he has a long history of not liking, but he has a couple of good professors who finally help him connect with literature. And he says, he goes, I have an aha moment, which is literature is a part of creativity. It can illuminate your life. And it's a source of so many ideas and inspiration. So once he makes that connection, he's like, oh, I love this now. Um, and he doesn't go back to Disney right away. He actually also has a love of stage plays. So he buys a theater with his um, brother, Fred, and they try to stage a lot of musicals. Unfortunately, it doesn't go quite well. There is a particular um, uh, event that lost them a lot of money, which he calls the damn Yankees debacle. Basically, they spent a whole bunch of money trying to get the rights and put it on and uh, they did not recoup the cost. And eventually the theater folds. He does go back to animation, but he doesn't go back to Disney. He doesn't know if he's quite ready to go back to Disney yet, but he wants to animate. so. He gets to, into Filmation, which Todd, does Filmation still exist? I think they do technically. Todd? Sorry about that, I was on mute. Oh. Let me check that quick, just a sec. Yeah, it was one where I'm like, I'm pretty sure they still exist, but the stuff he's working on, he does animation work for shows like Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Archie and Friends. They do an animated version of The Wizard of Oz. And he talks particularly about the screening of Wizard yeah. of Oz. Oh, they're still around? No, apparently they officially de they were declared defunct in 1989. Oh, that does not shock me. Um, <laughs> like their stuff is still being published and circulated, but as a company, they have not produced new content in better part of 30 years. Okay, um, yeah, that does not surprise me. He talks about, so he talks in his book about particularly the screening of Snow White and the, um, Snow White, the screening of this Wizard of Oz film. And he is like, I could just see the kids are not connecting with it and the magic is not there. And that's really for him, inspires him to go back to Disney Studios. And he's like, that's it. I've got to go somewhere where I feel like I can at least be challenged and do something that connects with people. Um, but there's also kind of a wrinkle in it. Walt Disney died. So by the time he's back, he's like, uh, you know, I don't, what do we like in, you know, he was like, what is Disney going to do? And frankly, the people, the nine old men, as he called it, like the original, the remaining original animators, they kind of didn't quite know what to do at this point either, other than just like, uh, keep doing what we're doing, I guess. So he leaves Filmation, which, well, the work at Filmation wasn't fulfilling. It was lucrative. He did good. He's basically is like, my boss was great. If I did good work, he would give me paid raises. I was able to support myself, support my family. But he, again, he's like, I've got to go where my heart's telling me to go and it's going back to Disney. So 1970, he returns. And again, after his mission trip to Argentina, he says he returns a more, again, a more humbled person. And rather than being someone who is trying to be a climber, he's seeing a lot of the people who are still there and who have you know advanced. And rather than being like, I'm going to get that position, he says, I'm happy for them. I'm glad that they've succeeded. And again, that's something his mission trip taught him was rather than only thinking of yourself, think of your whole working group as a team. And he gets started working on Robin Hood, again, doing kind of the in-between animations. Uh, there is a good story in there of him trying to get the king just right and just him like, why is this not working? Um, so while he's at Disney, Wolfgang Reitherman, or he is called Wooly in the book. If you do pick this book up, he is going to be known as Wooly for a majority of it. He is now the director of Disney Studios. And he actually believes in Don. He is a big supporter of him. And he's like, hey, I would like for you to direct the animation of Elliot in Pete's, uh, for Elliot and Pete's Dragon. Um, and that goes, that's iffy for Don because on one hand, he's like, okay, this is a chance to direct, but he also, he's like realizing, oh, being a director means you don't make everyone happy all the time. And it's a stressful thing for him. And he's also starting to realize 
this isn't like Sleeping Beauty. This isn't like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And this is uninspiring. It's not uninspiring at the level of some of the filmation stuff, but he's starting to get this inkling that Disney isn't what it used to be. So he meets um, his two future collaborators, Gary Goldman, who he is still friends with and still works with, and John Pomeroy. And these are the two people who eventually follow him out of Disney and help form, um, you know, Don Bluth Studios. They start doing animation off hours. And when I say he's doing the animation for his own short in his garage, we're not kidding. <laughs> So they want to do his own show, a uh, short called Banjo the Woodpile Cap, but Disney's like, no, short films don't make any money in release. There's no point in doing it. And earlier, there would be some short little films that were shown before the feature length Disney movies, which we have actually seen a return of now um, with the Pixar and Disney shorts. They might not show in front of all the films now, but they do usually get a release or usually the first week or so. It's if you go, you will also see this short. Um, and actually, if you want to look up Banjo the Woodpile Cat, there are stills that exist, and I think you can actually find the full length short itself. It's really cute. Um, but I sure we're seeing that one way back in the day. So yeah, yeah it's still out it there. It does exist. I think for a while it was a hard to find, it was a hard to find one. Um, but thanks to the internet now, you can find almost anything. But again, he's starting to get, um, as Drew McQueenie said earlier, Disney's not going to let me make my things. And he's starting to get frustrated. And he also notes that there's some other new upstart people here. Um, there's CalArts, which CalArts is pretty much a program that just funneled animators into Disney. Um, actually, if you've ever seen the, um, you'll see this in a lot of animation, but if you've ever seen A113, it can be a room number. Sometimes they put it on license plates. That is a reference to a Caltech classroom. So if you're ever watching an animated movie, you'll see it on The Simpsons, you'll see it in Pixar, you'll see it in some Disney movies. That is a shout out to CalArts because again, CalArts was the funnel to Disney. But you have people like John Lasseter, you have Brad Bird who did The Incredibles, John Lasseter who, um, Todd, why am I blanking on what John Lasseter directed? Wait. Toy oh. Story was like the big one. Yeah, I know. Oh my gosh, that's embarrassing. Yeah. There was that. I want to say anything to the Incredibles. I could be no, no Brad Bird Brad. Incredibles. And the other thing is like he was, it's not animation directed per se, but he was one of the big champions for getting Miyazaki's work over here. Yes, I was about to say John Lasseter, if you were a fan of Hayao Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli work, one of the reasons we got all of that stuff over here in the early aughts was because of John Lasseter and um, I will eventually do a Hayao Miyazaki program, but Hayao Miyazaki got burned in the late 80s, early 90s when Nausicaa Valley of the Wind was released over here as Warriors of the Wind, and it was just butchered, completely recut and distributed. And Miyazaki was not happy about that, and for years he was actually really resistant to releasing his work over here. And Lasseter was one of the people to be like, no, trust us, we will preserve your work, preserve your translation. I mean, some other stuff's come out about Lasseter, which is very disappointing, but um, at the very least, the professional stuff, I'm like, thank you. And yeah, I think a lot of people forget Tim Burton was also not only a CalArts guy, but someone who started at Disney. Um, I mean, he had Frankenweenie, which was a short and became a full-length feature film, but these were other people who were, again, getting frustrated and realizing like, I don't think we're gonna get to make our own movies. Although some of them kind of sparred with Don. They weren't quite on board with his vision. They actually thought Don was a little too old fashioned with what he wanted to do. Cause they're like, you just want to go back to the age of Walt Disney. That's gone. We need to go a different direction. But at the very least, all four of these people, Don along with John, Brad and Tim all eventually left Disney and branched out on their own. So 1979, this is the year. Don decides that's it, I'm done. So he, Gary Goldman and John Pomeroy, they all resign from Disney and they take over 10 staffers with them. So this is the list of people that came with him. John Etter, Will Finn, Heidi Gundell, Bruce Heller, Tom Hush, Emily Giuliano, Skip Jones, Dan um, Kunster, I'm going to apologize for butchering these names, Diane Landau, Doris Lamfer, Linda Miller, Dave Molina, Vera Pincheo, Jeff Patch, Lorena Pomeroy, who 
Richard, um, you know, was, became uh, John's wife. Dave Spafford and Kevin Wurzer. They all came with them and said, we believe in you and um, we'll help you out. And actually one of the good things about, um, cool things about Don while he had power at Disney was when he saw um, any woman animators doing any good job would be number one, like very outwardly congratulatory and try to promote them because uh, there is a really good book called Queens of Animation um, that you should read if you're interested in the old golden age of Disney. Um, it's about the women who worked at Disney, but Disney did try if there were talented women to um, give them a leg up. In particular, um, Mary Blair is the big one, but Dawn wanted to kind of continue that tradition of inspiring women in particular at Disney. So that's why a number of them left with them. And I loved this line from the book, and this is where he felt at the time and why he left. And he said to them, a good cartoon was one that put money in the, the bank. And to me, it's more than that. And uh, one of the reasons I like people like Don Bluth and similar to, you know, Martin Scorsese, who I covered last year, I love the idea of art for art's sake. The idea of this can't just all be about money and the, you know, the bottom line. This has to be about creativity and celebrating a vision. So Don, jo Don, Gary, and John leave. They take their animation with um, their animators with them. And Don Bluth Production is born later in 1979. And one of the first jobs is uh, a film that's become a bit of a punchline. It's uh, they work on Xanadu, but there is an animated sequence, and it's one of the better remembered parts of Xanadu. I don't know. I don't hate Xanadu. I think the soundtrack is great, and it's. It's more fascinating bad than bad bad. I mean, it, there, there's stuff to watch. <laughs> I mean, drop in the chat if you actually have an appreciation for the camp that is Xanadu. Um, so yeah, that, they're, one of their first jobs is animating a sequence for Xanadu. And he remembered like watching Xanadu and being like, oh no. Well, like, how is this going to be received? And he's like, well, at least they liked our part. And I mean, if you still talk to people at Xanadu, usually that comes up, they're like, oh, Don Blue's animation in that is really good. And decades later, the band Scissor Sisters, you know, they have a love for Xanadu and they reached out to Don and said, would you like to animate a video for us? And they, he did. And he talks about that in his book, goes, I love when this stuff just comes back around. So we have the first movie, um, again, Don Bluth did this all independently. Um, he did not have the war chest that Disney did and the League of Animators. So it took time to bring this all together. And it's adapted from the book, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. And one of the first problems they realized, wait a minute, there's a toy called Frisbee. Uh, I don't know if we can do this because uh, it might even run into a copyright problem. So they changed her name to Mrs. Frisbee. And if you haven't seen this film, it's about a widowed mouse who's trying to save her home. Her son is sick. And it is, it's a very, it's a film that it, the look is very dark. It's very scary. And it harkens back to, again, the conference, the final confrontation with the witch in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Um, or it's not quite as, as menacing, but the night on Bald Mountain sequence in Fantasia. Um, that again the level of darkness that early Disney films had and uh as John puts he goes this was made out of innocence i.e I just wanted to make something that was creative he didn't really care too much about financial gain I mean he did because you want to make money but for him he's like I want to put something good out into the world and this was a story that he really liked um when he first meets Gary and John they all talk about plotting and like you know how to make a story work and for him, they all just said like, this is it. This is our story. This is how it's going to work in animation. Um, also, uh, Dom DeLuise, who has been like, you know, was in on the, I just love that he was in on the ground floor with him, um, you know, voicing. It was made for about $7 million, which is, I'm, you know, that's not the budget for an animated movie anymore. But for the time, that was a good amount of money. So it managed to make enough money to keep everything afloat um when drew said it was a monster hit i think he might be remembering how it's viewed now i.e it's considered a landmark of animation but when the time it came out 
it barely broke even. It just made a little bit over. That's because it came out in the summer of 1982. And Todd, what else came out in the summer of 1982? Oh, uh, E.T. pretty much devoured everything that summer. Although, thankfully, a lot of a lot of its victims have since gone on to get a a rehabilitation in the public in the court of public opinion. Oh yeah. So um, E.T. comes out. There's other films that came out in the summer of '82 right after E.T. Blade Runner came out, it was kind of stomped. The, John Carpenter's The Thing came out and was, it bombed. One of the reasons Secret of the Nim kind of managed to survive was it had a different niche than E.T. It was like, their parents were like, oh, it's an animated movie. I can take my kid to that versus, you know, like, you know, um, Blade Runner and The Thing, which were more adult oriented. And I think everyone just wanted the niceness of E.T. And this isn't a slam on E.T. It's a good movie, but it is that you do. I don't think people realize just how much that movie steamrolled over everything else that came out that summer. It's uh, it, it is both impressive and kind of terrifying. It's similar to how um, I'm trying to think of a run like a uh, I don't know if Top Gun Maverick would be a good one-to-one, -one, but in 2018, when Black Panther came out and just dominated the box office for almost two months, and just every other movie that came out just kind of was paled in comparison. I think that's a similar, that's a good, um, a similar uh, comparison to bring. But speaking of E.T., Steven Spielberg did see the film and did like it. And he reached out to uh, Don Bluth saying like, hey, do you want to make something? And Don's like, I don't know. I mean, Don doesn't quite like the idea of having a boss, but he's interested in it. Also, um, this is a story and nothing ever came of it, but um, Michael Jackson really enjoyed Secret of the Nim and reached out to Don with the um, intention of maybe getting an animated music video. Again, that kind of fell apart, but this did make an impact with important people in the industry. And it's probably, it is how Don was able to keep going because he had some powerful people in his corner. So the next we have, it's not a film, but it's Dragon's Lair. Um, video games were still pretty new at this point, And Don was initially kind of like a video game. I don't know about that. I don't know what that is. But as he puts it, a young man named Rick Dyer strolled into our lobby with a gaming concept he had been working on for a year, which is an interactive video game. And what sold Don on this was, it wasn't just going to be something as he kind of considered mindless, like um, Pac-Man or the Pong. It was going to be, you have to do a little bit more with it. You have to interact with it. And there would be animated in between sequences. And that is what he wanted Don to do. And... So again, film industry wasn't quite responding to him at that point. So he's like, well, I may as well take this job for Dragon's Lair. And that game, that turned out to be a great decision because the game, huge hit, makes a ton of money and you know he gets a cut of it. And then they decide, they decide to work on another video game called Space Ace. Space Ace does not do as well and it almost, bankrupts uh the Don Blue studio he's like we put all of this money and effort into it and the game bombed and they don't recoup the cost so it looks like Don is in trouble until Steven Spielberg comes along and is um says hey I would like to collaborate with you on a movie apologies if anyone see me I have like an eyelash in my eye and I love how it took right as I started recording to just pluck its way in there so we have in 1986 an American tale. So he works with Steven Spielberg and the way he describes Steven is, I think the two best words would be benevolent, but very, very particular. So Steven would have these notes of like, this is a little too scary. Maybe we should do this instead of that. But Steven is also really believes in his work and really wants to get this movie out. So Unlike Michael Jackson, who wanted to do something and then kind of fell off, um, you know, dropped out of that conversation. And then Space Age, which just kind of went nowhere. He does get the sense that Spielberg is in this for the long haul. And that gives him kind of a sense of, um, of security. Also, if you note in, um, on the bullet point, there is a new studio. Um, it's Sullivan Bluth Studios. And this kind of becomes a running thing with, uh, with uh, Don Bluth is 
if he runs out of money, he just makes a new studio. And, uh, but I, when I was younger, I kind of just saw this as a sign of, oh, he's not good with money. But again, it is a lot harder to just independently finance these films. And if you don't have the money that Disney has, you might have to just declare bankruptcy and start over. Um, so if you haven't seen an American tale, this is about a young mouse. Um, he and his family are emigrating from Russia. They're going to America. And I rewatched this film about five years ago. And I, this was a movie that was on heavy rotation in my house. It is a very intense film about the immigrant experience. The film actually opens with a pogrom, um, which is, if you're not familiar with what that is, that is a uh, particularly an attack on Russian um, citizens by uh, usually by citizens and um, sometimes state or local police forces. <laughs> so it's like, oh, a children's movie starts out like this. And some people think that's too dark, but it's like, well, this is how and why a lot of people came to America because they're like, it's not safe where we live but we've heard in America, things are better. We can live as we want and without fear of death, of persecution. I mean, there's the whole, the whole song, it's cute. There are no cats in America, but for an American tale, similar as with um, Art Spiegelman's mouse, albeit nowhere near as depressing, the cats are there to represent the forces that oppress these creatures and are driving them out of their homes. So the movie comes out, and it, this, you know, this Drew McQueenie is the monster hit. 84 million worldwide on a $9 million budget. And you look at this movie and you're like, nine, this was made for just 9 million. It looks incredible, especially the remastered uh, look. I still wish this would get like a really, really great Blu-ray or 4K release. The ones that are there right now, the color's been cleaned up, but it's still... I'd like for it to get more of a Criterion or a Chef Factory treatment than just the kid version. Um, and for a time, this is the highest grossing animated feature of all time. It was not a Disney movie. It was scrappy old Don Bluth. Um, and it's, it's praised for, again, telling a fairly intense and involving story while also, you know, being still very child friendly, again, presenting the immigration story for kids in a way that is palatable and easy to understand. Um, also, Disney starts to go, ooh, we have, Don Bluth didn't go away. We have competition now. So they re release Lady and the Tramp as competition. And then a few months prior in the summer of 86, oh, Todd, could you let someone in? Thank you. Um, they released The Great Mouse Detective as well. So they're starting to get a sense of, oh, Don Bluth is not gonna go away. So <laughs> they gotta do that. I also included the picture of the Mouse of Minsk because as a child, that terrified me. I think out of anything in a Don Bluth film, that scared me so much in the way it is animated. Uh, it's, you know, it's something that is handmade and built, but the way the flames and the fireworks are shooting out of the back of the mouse's head, when you're four years old, that's a terrifying image. So I wanted to include it to uh, say, thanks, Don, you scared me. <laughs> so moving on, he's riding high off of an American tale. We go to The Land Before Time, which is, uh, you know, before Jurassic Park, this was the dinosaur film every kid grew up with and loved. So actually, I mean, feel free to put in the chat if you grew up with Land Before Time. Which, oh, realized I can't see the chat. So that comes out in November of 88. This is a second collaboration with Spielberg. And this is also where he's getting the notes of, it's like, this is a little too scary. This is a little too much for kids. We don't want them to be crying in the lobby. But Don kind of pushes back. He's like, I think kids can handle a little bit of darkness. Um, I was say, Todd, can you please let Pamela in? She's in, or at least she. She had huh. two logins. One is in, the other is listed as joining. Huh. Oops, gotta go back. Well, I don't know why that is still showing up on my screen. Uh, one moment. All right. This is the fun of uh, 
the fun, the fun of technical difficulties. There we go. All right, Land Before Time. Um, so if you've not seen this movie, it is young dinosaurs, including an, um, an orphaned, I guess, brontosaurus, or is it apatosaurus? Uh, I love dinosaurs, but I know for a while they were like the apatosaurus technically isn't, or not the apatosaurus, the brontosaurus technically wasn't real. And then they went back and said, actually it was, it was a misidentified dinosaur. But a little dinosaur named Littlefoot teams up with a triceratops named Sarah, um, a stegosaurus named Spike, a little uh, dinosaur named Ducky, and a pterodactyl named Petrie. And they have to go find their families in the Great Valley. Um, the place where they live, it's becoming too arid. The water is drying up. There's no food for them to graze on. But they get separated from their family in an earthquake. So it's a story of not just self-reliance, but reliance on each other, the importance of teamwork in, in a community. And it's also this kind of journey of trying to find the promised land. And actually when Don's talking about this in his book, he kind of relates it to the Mormons, um, kind of the struggle of the Mormons of like, we are trying to find a place where we can live as well. Um, but yeah, the collaboration with Spielberg, I got the sense in his book, um, one thing to note about Don, he doesn't like to speak ill of anybody too much but the sense I got was I guess he just did not he he just wanted to really be his own boss at this point rather than have to be beholden to anybody else and that's probably why he did not stick with Spielberg but again this did pay off the budget was his most expensive today of almost 13 million but it's over 80 million and it competes directly with all the Disney film Oliver and Company and it not only survives financially, it is more critically acclaimed than Oliver and Company, and I would argue better remembered than the two films, probably because who is a kid going to like more, Billy Joel or Dinosaurs? I mean, I like Billy Joel, but if you ask what I'd rather watch, I'd still rather watch a dinosaur movie. Um, and also, again, uh, Oliver and Company is a film that's, it's all right. Whereas Land Before Time, it's this film, it, it for a film that is barely 80 minutes it is a roller coaster ride of emotion and adventure and um i think for people my age and like their mid-30s littlefoot's mother dying is our generation's bambi's mom being shot like people will still go like oh god one of the most heartbreaking things i ever saw as a child was littlefoot saying goodbye to his mom um also great thing about this the score in this movie is beautiful um, and the animation is gorgeous, like especially at the end where you see the Great Valley, all like it's so lush and colorful. And I always love to see that in animation. Um, actually, just a quick shout out, um, Shout Factory re-released. It's not a Don Bluth film, but um, Fern Gully. In the cleaned up print of that, the forest looks incredible. So uh, Number one, uh, keep buying physical media because um, streaming companies aren't always going to keep everything, but you will also see the work that a lot of people put in to restore these films. And here we have All Dogs Go to Heaven, which is Don Bluth's final good film in almost a decade. And it is a film that's marred with some trouble. So he's no longer working with Spielberg. Um, so, but, you know, he's working for himself, but that means financing is a little bit harder. Um, and it also, which we'll discuss a little later, has a horrible tragedy hanging over its head. Um, the genesis of this film is when Don Bluth was a kid, he had a teacher that read from this book called All Dogs Go to Heaven and told the story of a dog that did bad things, but had a chance to come back and do a good thing and then go to heaven. So he wanted to actually find this book. He finds it, he buys it and reads it and turns out the story he remembered wasn't in there. And he's like, did my teacher just make this up? But he says, you know what? This story is good anyway, and I love this title. Um, so it is about Charlie, who is voiced by uh, Burt Reynolds, a dog that has kind of, you know, he's pretty much the, like, a gangster, dies and is told, you know, is like, oh, you weren't quite a good dog. But he gets a watch and it's like, if you go, you do have a chance to go back down and redeem yourself, but if the watch stops and you haven't redeemed yourself, you can't, you're, you're, you can't come back here is the point. So he finds it, befriends an orphan girl named Anne Marie. And he initially thinks like, oh, I can just use her to make money at the track and then grows to care for her. And at the end of the film, he finally 
he has to choose between saving her and saving himself and he makes the selfless selfless choice to save her and he goes to heaven and gets his wings um it's a beautiful film can't recommend watching if you have recently lost a pet uh, but it's still good uh dom deluise and burt reynolds are fantastic together um so one of the stories Don tells is when, you know, so he's worked with Dom DeLuise in all of his films and I have Dom Bluth to thank for getting me to appreciate Dom DeLuise because by the time I saw Blazing Saddles, I'm like, oh, that's the guy from the Dom Bluth movies. Um, Burt Reynolds is coming in and he's trying to do a dog voice. And Don's trying to say, I don't think that voice is good. Just use your normal voice. And Burt's kind of pushing back because he's like, no, I think it'd be better if I do a dog voice. Dom comes in, kind of slaps him on the back and says, don't do that voice. It sounds stupid. Listen to the man. <laughs> and he said, he goes, if you like, um, the way they recorded was rather than being in separate booth, they would record together. And Don was like, there is nothing. He goes, it's just such a delight to see Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise just play off each other. And they were great friends in real life, but he's like, to see that and then be able to capture that in animation, he goes, that's such a gift. Um, so unfortunately this comes out right along the time as Disney's The Little Mermaid. And um, I used the term earlier, Disney Renaissance. And this was when Disney, it was like the mojo's back, the box office is back. And that started with The Little Mermaid. So, well, this movie made money and it did make money back. Look at how much it made versus how much The Little Mermaid made. Ho. Oh, that was not a good sign for Don. So Don did kind of get his wish, the idea of someone giving Disney competition, but um, Disney decided to respond to that competition finally with upping its game. Uh, he also tells a story when they were working on this, they were in Ireland. Roy Disney comes in, um, meets with Don and offers Don a place back at Disney. Don turned it down specifically because he said, I think he was only offering me a place at Disney. And he's like, I did not want to abandon my animators and abandon my partners. But he also kind of took it as, oh, this means he's scared. This means we can, it's game on. Unfortunately it was game on, but um, this was game Disney one. And on a far more tragic note, uh, Judith Barcy, um, a young child actress, she was also the voice of Ducky in Land Before Time, um, was murdered by her father. Um, her father was abusive towards her and her mother, and unfortunately, as with many domestic abuse cases, it ended in tragedy. And um, Don does not talk about it much in the book, other than mentioning it was a very very um, hard post-production because the animators had to listen to this poor little girl that was no longer with them. And uh, he actually said it did slow down post-production because for a while we just couldn't do it. And um, he did speak about this briefly at, in a GalaxyCon interview, um, I believe late last year, earlier this year. And it's clearly something that still weighs on him. I just don't think he talks about it that much, which I can't blame him, but um, it was also a far more tragic note for this. It's um, the final, the film that is kind of, it signals the end of Don Bluth's reign in animation, but also it is the final film of a, you know, a collaborator who he worked, someone he worked with and wanted to work with um, in the future who uh, was taken way before her time. So we go on to the 90s and the 90s were for the most part not good for Don. Um, he made four movies, Rockadoodle, which um, remind me in question time to ask me why Rockadoodle is a somewhat traumatic movie for me, uh, but I won't get into it now. A Troll in Central Park, Thumbelina and the Pebble and the Penguin. None of these films do well on either a critical or financial front. Um, Rockadoodle in particular, they're working with Goldcrest um, and Goldcrest, while they were trying to finish Rockadoodle, was liquidating its assets. It was going out of business and it was firing animators. So while they're trying to finish this movie, it's, 
you know, they're getting their legs cut off while trying to do it. And Rock-A-Doodle, I think of these four movies is probably the best of the four. It's at least trying something. I like that it's going for something a little different and definitely not something that Disney was doing, but it doesn't work in t- uh, at all. Like, it's just one where it's like, you gotta call a spade a spade when something doesn't work. Thumbelina is also in the same camp of there's some good things in here, but it overall does not work. Um, there is a funny work story about it where Don admits to making one of the biggest professional mistakes of his career. Initially, to voice a care, um, a tiny, I think it's a tiny rat. He wanted to have Betty White do the voice of Golden Girls fame and just overall America's, America's grandma. She, he just said she must have been having an off day because she did not sound great. So he calls in another actress and uh, apparently Betty White and that other actress talked and uh, Betty was not too happy with that. And he's just like, yeah, that, that, was, a, that, was, some, that was a mess I had to clean up. So, um, that, but it is one where it's like, it's like, oh, I, I do love behind the scenes stories like that. Then you have a troll in Central Park, arguably his biggest failure. That movie barely makes a million dollars and it's awful. Um, it is one I have seen, it's bad. And then the Pebble and the Penguin, which I have not seen because it is so awful, Don and Gary just didn't even want their names attached. And this was another one where the financiers were calling the shots and also firing staff. So if you ever do look at stills of Pebble and the Penguin, there's animation that is completely static in the background, which is not something Don wants with these, with his movies. He wants them to look like feature-length animated films, not cheaply animated movies. So after four failures in a row, Don Bluth Limited folds and Don Bluth is looking for work. But luckily, Savior comes in the form of a um, supposedly alive, Russian princess. And that is Anastasia, or again, if we're talking proper pronunciation, Anastasia. I know this because my mother has repeatedly told me that she, um, Anastasia was one of her picks to name me as a child. Um, I think she got vetoed on that one. Um, So November of 97, and this is from Fox Animation. So again, taking a cue from Don Bluth, Fox, you know, there are people in Fox like, hey, let's give Disney a run for their money. Pixar's doing it again. Pixar wasn't always a part of Disney. Um, and DreamWorks at the time was also trying to start up their 2D animation um, department with the incredible Prince of Egypt, by the way, which is an amazing movie. And then a few years later, Warner Brothers uh, does The Iron Giant, which not well received box office wise at the time, but is instantly a critical hit and has been completely, it's now beloved by audiences. So we are kind of seeing competitors to Disney pop up. So Bill Mechanic calls Don Bluth and is like, hey, do you want to help me make a movie? And so Don Bluth goes from Ireland back to Arizona, um, which I I would not do that. I am clearly a person who would rather live in the cold than the heat, but he can do him. And uh, at first he is not sold on doing Anastasia because he's talking to Gary and he's like, but she's probably dead. And keep in mind in the late nineties, we did not have the genetic confirmation that Anastasia died with her family. Uh, We now have proof that everyone perished that day. But if you aren't familiar with this for decades, this rumor, this um, story persisted that potentially Anastasia may may have survived. She played dead and a someone kind just let her escape and she might still be out there somewhere but Don was like "Uh, I'm pretty sure she just died and isn't this in bad taste which you know what Don I agree (laughs) um but he decides like well work is work and Gary Goldman kind of sells him on like but there's a larger story here of finding who you are trying to find your home and Lee's like, let's just use Anastasia as a jumping off point for this larger story. So this movie comes out around Christmas time and it's a huge hit. It's his first hit in a decade. And he's starting to make Disney Renaissance money, making $140 million on a $50 million budget. And for all of my problems with this movie, um, I rewatched it. It does hold up as a film. I think it's actually really good. Um, I really can't get past the blatant historical inaccuracies. Um, and I think it's, 
I think it's kind of bad taste for the musical to exist now because I'm like, come on guys, we know she didn't make it. But if we're to, as a movie in the context of the time, I think it does work. The animation is great. Um, I love the big crowd scenes. I love the, co uh, the color palette for it. It works and it bought Don a lot of goodwill. Unfortunately, the next movie he made undid all that. Um, and it's really not Don's fault. So he's called in to pretty much save this science fiction film called Titan AE. And initially he was supposed to get um, Ice Age. So if you're familiar with Ice Age, that was done, uh, released, uh, was done in part with Blue Sky Animation. That was supposed to be a 2D animated movie and then it got given to the 3D people, which I'm angry because I want a Don Bluth version of Ice Age. We could have gotten Dom DeLuise. He was still around, he could have done it. Anyway, he's called in to save Titan AE, which he actually thought initially, like, wouldn't this be better as a live action film? Which, yes and no. So if you're unfamiliar with Titan AE, it does have a cult following now. Um, it starts with Earth being destroyed by aliens, um, but one, guy, one scientist, um, created a device that could create a new earth and his son is the only one that has like the key the map on his hand so humans are about 20 years later basically just refugees floating around the earth um and you know the main character kale meets up with other people who are like that's it let's try to create a new earth and a new home um this was actually i'll get to that in a minute so the behind the scenes debacle is by the time Don gets there, they've already spent $30 million, but not a frame had been animated. And he was told like, oh yeah, that's just all got to come out of your budget. So he and Gary Goldman really do their darndest to try to save this movie. And uh, well, it gets relatively good critical acclaim. Roger Ebert in particular is a huge supporter of it. It doesn't do well at the box office. It's a bomb and Fox Animation was already in trouble and this was just the nail in the coffin. And it was just also coming at a time, Toy Story came out five years ago, but a lot of 2D animated movies were not doing well at this point. Um, the Iron Giant the year before failed at the box office even though it found a second life on home media. Prince of Egypt was a hit, but Road to El uh, from DreamWorks, but Road to El Dorado, the follow-up underperformed, which is a shame because Road to El Dorado is also great. But animators are starting to see the writing on the wall. Computer animation, it's a little cheaper, it's not as taxing, and it can be outsourced a little bit easier. So it's look the computer animation, the CGI is where it's going. So Don kind of sees that you know, basically this is it. I don't think I can work anymore. And now this was the movie I was the most scared to revisit because full disclosure, I was a huge nerd as a teen. I don't think anyone's shocked by that, but I loved this movie when it came out. I saw it, I think three times in theaters. I had like, I really loved it. Um, so when I came home and saw Todd watching it, I was like, oh no, is, am I about to get my nostalgia glasses broken? And Overall, I think it holds up pretty well. Um, the CG, like there is like a fusion of CGI animation and hand in a traditional 2D. They do not mesh well together. They don't. That in the, in the light of day, it's like, oh, this, that has not held up. But all of the 2D animation looks really great. I love a lot of the alien creature designs. I think the people designs are cool. One of the things I love about Titan AE is like, there is this, again, humans are refugees. So we see how they live on these like barred ships and the place looks lived in. It looks dingy. It looks, it looks like a place where people who have no real, like no home have to live. And all of Don Bluth's movies, the backgrounds have always looked lived in, like a place where, peop where people actually have to stay. And no shade to films like Encanto, which I think is really good. And I think the fact that we're seeing a lot of animated movies tackle some tougher subjects is because Don Bluth back in the 80s was not afraid to be like, let's have some darkness in these movies. Let's get a little difficult. But like the house in Encanto looks immaculate. I don't believe anybody lives there. 
Uh, whereas for places like Titan AE and American Tale, I'm like, oh, I absolutely believe people and characters live here. Although I, I do want to give a shout out to another modern animated movie like um, Into the Spider-Verse and Turning Red. I totally believe people live in those places. So, but um, it, it, it overall holds up. Todd, you, you watched it too. What do you think? Am I uh, still being too kind to a former favorite movie? No, no, no. I'd say you're pretty accurate. I mean, the script definitely has, has some markers of there were some developmental issues, but CG aside, the animation looks good. About the only other thing I'd say is a mark against it is he's a good actor. God bless him. But Matt Damon can't voice act to save his life. No, he can't. Although uh, Bill Pullman is really good and uh, Drew Barrymore is the rest actually of the cast really is actually good. Yeah, the rest of the cast in general is good. He is just kind of the one weak link in the chain. Well, and that's, that is unfortunately, I know people like to pinpoint the idea of celebrity casting for animated movies with Robin Williams in Aladdin, but that was well before that. Again, Dom DeLuise and Burt Reynolds were in All Dogs Go to Heaven. Dom DeLuise was in all of Don Bluth's 80s films. And if you look back at um, earlier Disney movies, they had celebrity voices as well. It's just not celebrities we recognize. So, um, wasn't one of the Gabor sisters in The Rescuers? It was either Jasha or Ava. But it was Bob Newhart and one of the Gabor sisters in The Rescuers. So the idea of celebrity voice casting has been around almost as long as animation itself. Um, but one of the downsides is there, you know, there are trained voice actors who know exactly how to do what they're doing, like um, Phil Lamar and uh, Joe DiMaggio. Uh, is, am I saying his name right? I always get him confused. Uh, that one's John DiMaggio, but yeah. John DiMaggio, I always get him confused with the baseball player. And, uh, you know, Kevin Conroy. Uh, these are all people who do stuff like Futurama, uh, Batman Animated Series. Those are voice actors. They are trained to, know, you know, they know that there's a difference between just reading a script and voice acting. But sometimes when you get actors in these positions, they think it's just reading a script and it does not translate. I love Tina Fey, but her vo she is not a voice actress. And yeah, Matt Damon's in the same camp. But I actually think Drew Barrymore and Bill Pullman, I'm like, get them in more voice acting. They're, they're really good in it. Also, so is John Leguizamo, but John Leguizamo gives 100% whatever he's in. <laughs> but yeah. Um, Unfortunately, yes, for um, all, my love for it aside and my box office contribution could not save Titan AE or Don Bluth's career. But Don Bluth is never someone who wants to think like, that's it, it's the nail in the coffin. He is always trying to look for new things to do and new ways to further his career. So what he is doing now is um, he, he basically says, he goes, I didn't want to wallow. I wanted to continue doing what I love. He believes that he was put on this earth to do animation and to help other people um, find their creativity. So what he does now is he has Don Blues University and he teaches students who have enrolled to the art of 2D animation. And 2D animation is alive and well in other countries. Um, France particularly has a lot of 2D animation. There's that Ireland company that does the film Secret of the Kells and Wolf Walkers. A lot of it's kind of a CGI fusion with 2D animation, but 2D exists outside of America. And actually even animation on television has 2D. So if Don ever wanted to go work on a show, he could. Uh, but he has decided, he's like, I am going to foster the next generation of animators. And he puts, it goes, maybe 3D animation is what studios can afford and audiences love, but the pendulum will swing back. And when it does, there'll be a host of animators ready to go. Um, and as someone who loves 2D animation, I love that optimism. There has always been a back and forth for the past 20 years for reviving Dragon's Lair. There has been talk of a live action movie. There has been talk of a full length animated feature. There have been Kickstarters. Of all the projects Don believes in, that is the one where I have a, I'll believe this when I see it. I don't know if it'll actually happen, but his most successful endeavor aside from his university right now is his theater. His love of live theater never completely went away. And he has the Don Blue Front Row Theater in Arizona. He's, he, um, they're still putting on productions. They had a little bit of a snafu with COVID. Um, right before COVID hit, the rent for his place went up. But thanks to COVID, he was able to find a cheaper place. 
and they're still putting on productions. He still, um, they're getting local theater awards. He even produces and um, produces direct certain live productions. So he is still directing and he is still keeping animation alive. And he shows um, no signs of stopping. Um, to close this out, I just wanna read from the final uh, part of his autobiography. He says, quote, someday I will put down the pencils, give them a rest and join the feathered choir where I will chat with family and friends that I haven't seen for a very long time. But topping that experience will be meeting, will be the meeting I will have with the father, the king and his son, Jesus Christ, the savior of the world. I am filled with gratitude. Some people never get to sing their song. I was lucky. I got to sing mine. And you know, it's a real hoot. I'm still singing. So he is currently 85 years old. And again, he shows no sign of slowing down and he is keeping the torch alive for 2D animation and does try to um, talk up other projects and give people a leg up. Also, there is a nice um, spot towards the end of his book where he goes back to Disney Studios to tour it. And while it's not entirely what he would like to see animation wise, what he does see is people there who are passionate about what they are making, people who are getting an opportunity to make the movies they want to make. So as he sees that he's like, the magic of Disney is back. It's not quite what I grew up with, but it is there. And um, so I think that's like a nice little closure for him is so he's kind of happy with what Disney is doing and he still, he's happy with where he is. Uh, reading his autobiography gave me a much different uh, view because for a while I kind of had the old, oh poor Don Bluth that guy got railroaded he just saw every potential roadblock uh you know bump in the road as a that's all it is and I have an opportunity to do something new so with that I'm gonna stop sharing and if anybody has any questions um feel free to ask I will tell the rockadoodle story if anybody wants me to sure I'll listen to it Okay, so um, Rockadoodle was what, 91? I think it was 91. So I was around five years old at the time. My babysitter took us to see it. I think it was one where my dad was in Okinawa and my mother was doing her Navy work. I was a military brat. So the baby, we had a babysitter for the weekend. And she's like, oh, I'll take you to see a movie. We go to see Rockadoodle. I don't know how much, I, I think I... I actually remember liking the movie a bit, but I come back and find that my two fish are dead. So I will always associate that movie with my fish dying. And when you're five, your fish dying is just the, wor the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, he is, uh, yeah. Anyone has any other questions? If you have a favorite Don Bluth film, I'd love to hear it. I, I just was amazed to see all this about Dom DeLuise. I never, I never knew that. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I, I mean, I think of him as Blazing Saddles and some of those mm -hmm. stupid things he did like that, and it's, he's, it's well, just kind of. So he talks in his book about how every story there's a hero, a villain, and a clown, and he's like, I had the best clown in Dom DeLuise. Oh yeah. He's and he always is, been a funny guy, yeah. Yeah, and he he just said, like, the stories he has about Dom DeLuise in his book, one of the first ones he has is uh, he brings his little old Italian mother in, and um, <laughs> Dom is, he goes, like, Dom's being pretty blue on the mic before we start recording, and Dom DeLuise sees Dom's face like, your mom's right there, and Dom just goes, oh, no, don't worry, she's Italian and can't hear. She doesn't hear a word I'm saying. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, uh, I, I credit Don Bluth with making me appreciate Dom DeLuise because I'm like, that was my gateway introduction to him. I was like, oh, hey, it's, it's the cat from an American tale. <laughs> also, yeah, that was funny to hear. It's yeah, not Don, like, oh, he's this or that. He's from the cat. <laughs> yeah, he is. Uh, he's, uh, although Dom, Don, uh, again, he tries to not be too mean, which, uh, again, something I admire because I am a far pettier person, but he, uh, people have asked him what he thinks of the sequels to An American Tale and Land Before Time. And he's like, oh, there's how many Land Before Time sequels? Huh, those all exist. I haven't seen any of them. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he was very like this, I made the movie I wanted to make and that's it. Uh, 
which I mean, the fact that we're now seeing it in Hollywood, like so many sequels, so many reboots, so many remakes, I have to admire someone who just said, nope, I've told the story and we're done. <laughs> I didn't know. realize he had a hand in so many of my childhood favorites, like Thumbelina. Mm -hmm. I mean, I watched that on repeat. I Same. even just didn't have my VHS Thumbelina, even though I haven't played it in 20 years. Like, <laughs> I I've not. rented it on I've streamed it, but like, yeah, no, I still love it. Um, and then like Anastasia, mm -hmm. same thing. Like I watch that movie all the time. Yeah, I have not gone back and watched Thumbelina. That was one where I just decided, I'm like, I liked it when I was young, but everything else I know about that era, I'm like, I'm just gonna keep that as a childhood favorite and not revisit it. But all of his 80s stuff I've revisited. As I said earlier, Titan AE was the one I was like, oh, is this gonna hurt or not? <laughs> I don't think I watched that one, but I think my brother did. Yeah, it's a, I, I, it's overall pretty good. I, I, I enjoy it. Um, and again, some of it could just be nostalgia goggles. Sometimes that stuff is really hard to take off. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, I still think it's pretty good. <laughs> I'm definitely going to have to go back and watch more. Yeah, awesome. And yeah, I really recommend his autobiography. It's a quick read. And he has a lot of good stories in there. I'm gonna have to. Thank awesome. you so much. Does the does the Dairy Library have it? I don't believe we do, but I could um I could request I could see if we could get a copy. <laughs> All right. I mean, worst case, your local bookstore will likely have it. Um, I don't like to encourage people to use Amazon, but it is an option. I don't know. Maybe our consortium might have it. I, I might double check because for a while it wasn't there, but that may change. Because uh, I do know for a while, no one had a um, only two libraries had a copy of that Jeanette McCurdy book. And now because it's become a bestseller, every library is getting two copies, which yeah. I did read the Jeanette McCurdy book. Oh man, I couldn't put that one down. <laughs> that's the book that's called I'm Glad My Mom Died. Okay. I don't think I've heard of it. Oh, it's the girl, she was on like iCarly or something. It was a show that was past my time, but she basically had a uh, a very awful stage mother and she writes about that. Yeah. I know it's a, and it's, um, it, it was actually one that, well, cause I was prepping for this and I was reading that. It did make me think of Judith Barcy who, I don't think she had stage parents, but I think her parents were both new to the country and I just, I don't think her mother knew how to navigate like restraining orders and protection orders. And it just, it's a situation that just ended so tragically. No. Yeah, no, that's, I didn't want to dwell on that that much because I'm like, well, this is just sad and everyone's going to feel awful and I don't want that. Yeah. But, um, it's again, just, just reading how he wrote, like, he's just like, yeah, it, some animators just couldn't even put it together. Cause we're like, we need a break. We can't listen to this right now. And I, I mean, the few times I've seen him talk about it, I think it still weighs on him, which I think it would for any reasonable person to have, to be even tangentially connected to a tragedy like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That was something I did not know until like a few years ago. And I'm like, oh no, a childhood favorite movie has a tragic backstory. No. So is that any idea? I know the way they used to do the, the uh, animation was by cells. I mean, thousands upon thousands of cells. Yep. So they use computers now. How does, do you have any idea how that works? I mean, I mean, is it, I guess it's a program, obviously, of some it kind. It is. So there was an interview that Don did with, a, I believe it was GalaxyCon. It was a Zoom interview because, you know, Don's 85 years old. I'm pretty sure he does not want to go to a big gathering where he could potentially get COVID. Right. Um, he was doing it remotely. Um, and he, the way he talked about it was he views CGI animation more as puppetry because you're essentially moving something you're putting something in to move something a certain way and he goes i see that more as puppetry rather than animation oh okay he's it, um and he i think he's coming around with having some respect for it but at the end of the day uh you you look at the way old animators used to work that was grueling work and i can't even imagine i mean there's literally thousands upon thousands of you know and each one is a little different. I mean, it's pretty amazing, yeah. And it's one of the sadder things that I've met with people who love animation is 
one of the big sellers, like if you go to anime conventions, there used to be dealers who would have sells from films and from series uh, from Japan. And because a lot of animation is moving at least not entirely away from 2D, but like in Japan, there's now like a, it's like a CG 2D hybrid, which in some ways is good. It helps get some of the herky jerkiness out. It's a little bit smoother, but um, you know, we're not even seeing cells of animation anymore. And people used to like, I know people who collect them and get them framed. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Todd, I think you have a few cells, right? Or do we not? Surprisingly, no. I mean, I've looked at them. I've never actually found where I looked and went, okay, A, I'm interested in B, this is in my price range, but I, I do still look when we're at cons. Uh, yeah, I know, but it's like, it's something that is becoming something of the past and there used to be a big market for Disney cells and it's just, that doesn't right. exist anymore. I'd, I'd give good money for a cell from like Aladdin or, or uh, Beauty and the Beast. They did a antique roadshow had some on there. I mean, it sounds stupid, but they had somebody who had some cells from from some of the Disney ones, and yeah, they're worth a lot of money. Yeah. Oh, they are, and it's uh, there is again. I can't recommend the book Queens of Animation enough because I mean, yes, it talks about the women who work there, but it also just goes into the work that went into two D animation. Oh yeah, and I don't. It's something where it's like, oh man, I I certainly couldn't do that. <laughs> takes a lot of patience sure. it absolutely does and it's um and that little nuance that's just that little bit from something where you know hand is moving or whatever that's just gotta be and some of that is almost kind of fun to, to you watch the older films now and you see some of just the the flaws that come through but it's like oh this is fun it it, it adds a little bit of character to it now mm -hmm. um it's but it's it's becoming a lot like i don't know I think a lot of it is just money in the United States. America in particular seems to view animation as mostly for children, but not on television. Cause television, we have numerous animated shows for adults and we all just accept that, but it rarely makes the jump to feature films. Um, and the same goes for CG where pretty much all of the animated movies for people for uh, like come out are CG, but you will still see like the hand-drawn animation or at least the look of 2D on television, like for stuff like uh, Archer, Bob's Burgers. But even now that stuff has the CGI assist to kind of smooth it out a bit. But uh, if you go to other countries, like France is big on 2D animation. Japan still does like 2D work. Um, there are still just big animation studios. Um, Again, if Don Bluth ever wanted to go over to Ireland, I think he could find work because there, there's two D, there's a studio up there that does two D animation. Wow. But um, I do love that he's trying to just keep that art alive because I, there is a nostalgia for it now because people my age grew up with it. And we're like, we're kind of getting tired of the sameness of CG. Not that there wasn't sameness with two D animation because people bring up oh yeah, Disney animators reused templates all the time. And I'm like, well, yeah, you have to at some point. But I, I do wonder if we are eventually going to see a shift where we might see just one big 2D film make a, a lot of money and then studios will say, hey, maybe we should invest in this again. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm keeping hope alive. I, I love animation and I love to see it in all of its forms. It shouldn't just be one thing. You know, it's kind of like music when uh, when they came out to, you know, all this stuff is all these digital recordings and stuff. And people said, oh, vinyl's dead and all this. And how many people now are going back to vinyl because the yep. sound is so much better and saying, yeah, look at the sound and look at the difference. Yeah. Well, yeah. with physical media went through that um, for with streaming. There were a lot of people just saying, oh, get rid of all your DVDs, Blu-rays. You don't need it anymore. And then very quickly, there became so many streaming services and everything became so segmented. Mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of people like Todd and I we have a huge collection of physical media because we're like nope we're keeping this stuff and there are physical media companies that are trying to do restorations um mm -hmm. Criterion Collection, Shout Factory, Arrow, um, Shout Factory in particular does try to get um, animation and uh, actually a nice announcement sort of tying into this uh, Criterion just announced they um, partnered with Pixar to do a 4k restoration of WALL-E Wow. Um, and yeah, the, uh, the Fern Gully uh, Blu-ray that just came out looks beautiful. The colors are so rich and lush. And they actually have the old trailers from the film that you can watch. And you're like, oh, wow, 
I don't remember the color looking this faded, but it must have, and it's been restored now, and it looks beautiful. No. Um, I and I'd love I'm to see a restoration for Don Bluth's movies. That's that's my big that's my big ask is like someone restore his eighties films. <laughs> That's that's really cool. Yeah, I was going to say, we my voice is starting to go, so I should probably wrap this up. Okay. <laughs> too, much screaming, too much screaming for Debbie Harry this weekend. <laughs> Take care. All righty. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. Good night. Good night.